The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodward Payne. Chapter 1. Ancestry and Early Youth in Boston. Twyford at the Bishop of St. Asaph's, 1771. Begin footnote. Twyford is a small village not far from Winchester in Hampshire, southern England. There was the county seat of the Bishop of St. Asaph, Dr. Jonathan Shipley, the good bishop as Dr. Franklin used to style him. Their relations were intimate and confidential. In his pulpit, and in the House of Lords as well as in society, the bishop always opposed the harsh measures of the crown towards the colonies. End footnote. Dear son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes of my ancestors. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England, and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagining it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are yet unacquainted with, and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement, I sit down to write them to you, for which I have besides some other inducements. Having emerged from the poverty and obscurity in which I was born and bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, the conducting means I made use of, which with the blessing of God so well succeeded, my posterity may like to know, as they may find some of them suitable for their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflect on it, has induced me sometimes to say, that were it offered to my choice, I would have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events of it for others more favorable. But though this were denied, I should still accept the offer. Since such a reputation is not to be expected, the next thing most like living one's life over again seems to be a recollection of that life, and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall indulge the inclination so natural in old men to be talking of themselves and their own past actions, and I shall indulge it without being tiresome to others, who, through respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not as any one pleases. And lastly, I may as well confess it, since my denial of it will be believed by nobody, perhaps I shall a good deal gratify my own vanity. Begin footnote. In this connection Woodrow Wilson says, and yet the surprising and delightful thing about this book is that, take it all in all, it has not the low tone of conceit, but is a staunch man's sober and unaffected assessment of himself and the circumstances of his career. Gibbon and Hume, the great British historians, who were contemporaries of Franklin, express in their autobiographies the same feeling about the propriety of just self-praise. End footnote. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words, without vanity I may say, etc., with some vain thing immediately following. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have of it themselves, but I give it fair quarter whenever I meet with it, being persuaded that it is often productive to the good possessor, and to others that are within his sphere of action, and therefore, in many cases, it would not be altogether absurd if a man were to thank God for his vanity among the other comforts of life. And now I speak of thanking God, I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe 
the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence which led me to the means i used and gave them success my belief of this induces me to hope though i must not presume that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in continuing that happiness or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse which i may experience as others have done the complexion of my future fortune being known to him only in whose power it is to bless to us even our afflictions the notes one of my uncles who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family anecdotes once put into my hands furnished me with several particulars relating to our ancestors from these notes i learned that the family had lived in the same village ecton in northamptonshire for three hundred years and how much longer he knew not perhaps from the time when the name of franklin that before was the name of an order of people begin footnote a small landowner end footnote was assumed by then as a surname when others took surnames all over the kingdom on a freehold of about thirty acres aided by the smith's business which had continued in the family till his time the eldest son being always bred to that business a custom which he and my father followed as to their eldest sons when i searched the registers at ecton i found an account of their births marriages and burials from the year fifteen fifty five only and there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding by that register i perceived that i was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back my grandfather thomas who was born in fifteen ninety eight lived in ecton until he grew too old to follow business longer when he went to live with his son john a dyer at branbury in oxfordshire and whom my father served as an apprentice there my grandfather died and lies buried we saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son, Thomas, lived in the house at Ecton, and left it, with the land, to his only child, a daughter, who, with her husband, one Fisher, of Wellingborough, sold it to Mr. Isted, now lord of the manor there. My grandfather had four sons that grew up, viz. Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I will give you what account I can of them, at this distance from my papers, and if these are not lost in my absence, you will among them find many more particulars. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but, being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an Esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish, he qualified himself for the business of Scrivener, became a considerable man in the county, was a chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for the county, or town of Northampton, and his own village, of which many instances are related of him, and which taken notice of and patronized by the then Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January 6th, Old Style, just four years to the day before I was born. Begin footnote. January 17th, new style this change in the calendar was made in fifteen eighty two by pope gregory the thirteenth and adopted in england in seventeen fifty two every year whose number in the common reckoning since christ is not divisible by four as well as every year whose number is divisible by one hundred but not by four shall have three hundred and sixty five days and all other years shall have three hundred and sixty six days in the eighteenth century there was a difference of eleven days between the old and new style of reckoning, which the English Parliament cancelled by making the 3rd of September, 1752, the 14th. The Julian calendar, or old style, is still retained in Russia and Greece, whose dates consequently are now thirteen days behind those of other Christian countries. End footnote. The account we received of his life and character from some old people at Ecton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary, from its similarity to what you knew of mine. Had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens. Benjamin was bred a silk dyer, 
serving an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man. I remember him well, for when I was a boy he came over to my father in Boston, and lived in the house with us some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind him two quattro volumes, manuscripts, of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relations, of which the following sent me is a specimen. He had formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but never practiced. I have now forgot it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father. He was very pious a great attendee of sermons of the best preachers, which he took down in his shorthand, and had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a politician, too much perhaps for his station. There fell lately into my hands in London a collection he made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting as appears by the numbering but there still remain eight volumes in folio and twenty-four in quattro and in octavo a dealer in old books met with them and knowing me by my sometimes buying of him he brought them to me it seems my uncle must have left them here when he went to america which was about fifty years since there are many of his notes in the margins the obscure family of ours was early in the reformation and continued protestants through the reign of queen mary when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery they had got an english bible and to conceal and secure it it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool when my great-great-grandfather read it to his family he turned up the joint stool upon his knees turning over the leaves then under the tapes one of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case, the stool was turned down again upon its feet, when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles the Second's reign, when some of the ministers had been outed for nonconformity holding conventicles in north hampshire benjamin and joshua adhered to them and so continued all their lives the rest of the family remained with the episcopal church conventicles were secret gatherings of dissenters from the established church joshua my father married young and carried his wife and three children into england about sixteen eighty two the convecticles having been forbidden by law and frequently disturbed induced some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove to that country and he was prevailed with them to accompany them thither where they expected to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom by the same wife he had four children more born there and by a second wife ten more in all seventeen of which i remember thirteen sitting at one time at his table who all grew up to be men and women, and married. I was the youngest son, and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. My mother, the second wife, was Abbeth Folger, daughter of Peter Folger, one of the first settlers of New England, of whom honorable mention is made by Cotton Mather. In his church history of that country, entitled Magnalia Christi Americana, as a godly learned englishman if i remember the words rightly i have heard that he wrote sundry small occasional pieces but only one of them was printed which i saw now many years since it was written in sixteen seventy five in the homespun verse of that time and people and addressed to those then concerned in the government there it was in favour of liberty of conscience and in behalf of the baptists quakers and other sectaries that had been under persecution ascribing the indian wars and other distresses that had befallen the country to that persecution as so many judgments of god to punish so heinous an offence and exhorting a repeal of those uncharitable laws the whole appeared to me as written with a good deal of decent plainness and manly freedom 
The six concluding lines I remember, though I have forgotten the two first of the stanza, but the purport of them was that his censures proceeded from goodwill, and therefore he would be known to be the author. Because to be a libeller, says he, I hate it with my heart. From Sherburn Town, where now I dwell, my name I do put here. Without offence, your real friend, it is Peter Folger. Franklin was born on Sunday, January 6th, Old Style, 1706, in a house on Milk Street, opposite the Old South Meeting House, where he was baptized on the day of his birth, during a snowstorm. The house where he was born was burned in 1810. Cotton Mather, 1663 to 1728, clergyman, author, and scholar, pastor of the North Church, Boston, he took an active part in the persecution of witchcraft. My elder brothers were all apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar, encouraged him in this purpose of his. My uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it, and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons. I suppose a stock to be set up with, if I would learn his character. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed to the next class above it, in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons that he gave to his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention, took me from the grammar school, and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Browell, very successful in his profession generally, and by mild, encouraging methods, under him I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic, and made no progress in it. At ten years old I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler a business he had not bred to, but had assumed on his arrival in New England, and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping mold, and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, going of errands, etc. I disliked the trade, and had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was much in and about it, learned early to swim well, and to manage boats, and, when in a boat or canoe with other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in any case of difficulty, and upon other occasions I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them into scrapes, of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a salt marsh that bounded part of the mill pond, on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much tramping we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf there fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would very well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently, like so many emmets, sometimes two or three to a stone, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at missing the stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers, and, though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. 
He had an excellent constitution of body, was of middle stature, but well set, and very strong. He was ingenious, could draw prettily, was skilled a little in music, and had a clear, pleasing voice, so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin, and sung with all, as he sometimes did in an evening after the business of the day was over, it was extremely agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius, too, and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools, but his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment in prudent matters, both in private and public affairs. In the latter, indeed, he was never employed. The numerous family he had to educate, and the straitness of his circumstances, kept him close to the, his trade. But I remember well his being frequently visited by leading people, who consulted him for his opinion in affairs of the town, or of the church he belonged to, and showed a good deal of respect for his judgment and advice. He was also much consulted by private persons about their affairs when any difficulty occurred, and frequently chosen an arbiter between contending parties. At his table he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with, and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse, which might tend to improve the minds of his children. By this means he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life, and little or no notice was ever taken of what related to the victuals on the table whether it was well or ill-dressed, in or out of season, of good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that other thing of the kind. So that was how I was brought up, in such a perfect inattention to those matters as to be quite indifferent what kind of food was set before me, and so unobservant of it, that to this day, if I am asked, I can scarce tell a few hours after dinner what I dined upon. This has been a convenience to me in travelling, where my companions have been sometimes very unhappy for want of a suitable gratification of their more delicate, because better instructed, tastes and appetites. My mother had likewise an excellent constitution. She suckled all her ten children. I never knew whether my father or mother to have any sickness but that of which they died he at eighty-nine, and she at eighty-five years of age. They lie buried together at Boston. I, some years since, placed a marble over their grave with this inscription, Josiah Franklin and Abbeth his wife, lie here in turn. They lived lovingly together in wedlock fifty-five years, without an estate or any gainful employment, by constant labor and industry, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling, and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in fifeful regard to their memory, places this stone. J. F., born 1655, died 1744, at 89. A. F., born 1667, died 1752, 85. This marble having decayed, the citizens of Boston in 1827 erected in its place a granite obelisk, 21 feet high, bearing the original inscription quoted in the text, and another explaining the erection of the monument. By my rambling digressions I perceive myself to be grown old. I used to write more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. Tis perhaps only negligence. To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, that is, till I was twelve years old, and my brother John, who was bred to that business, having left my father, married and set up for himself at Rhode Island there was all appearance that I was destined to supply his place and become a tallow chandler. But my dislike to the trade continuing, my father was under apprehensions that if he did not find one for me more agreeable, I should break away and go to sea, as his son Joshua had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners, bricklayers, turners, 
braziers, etc., at their work, that he might observe my inclination and endeavour to fix it on some trade or other, on land. It has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and it has been useful to me, having learnt so much by it, as to be able to do little jobs myself in my house, when a workman could not readily be got, and to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade, and my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about that time established in Boston, I was sent to be with him some time on liking. But his expectations of a fee with me displeased my father. I was taken home again. End of chapter 1 The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin Chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine Chapter 2 Beginning Life as a Printer From a child I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands was ever laid out in books. Pleased with the Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's works in separate little volumes. I afterwards sold them to enable me to buy R. Burton's historical collections. They were small Chapman's books, and cheap, forty or fifty in all. My father's little library consisted chiefly of books in polemic divinity, most of which I read, and have since often regretted that, at a time when I had such a thirst for knowledge, more proper books had not fallen in my way, since it was now resolved I should not be a clergyman. Plutarch's Lives there was in which I read abundantly, and I still think that time spent to great advantage. There was also a book of Defoe's called An Essay on Projects, and another of Dr. Mather's called Essays to Do Good, which perhaps gave me a turn of thinking that had an influence on some of the principal future events of my life. This bookish inclination at length determined my father to make me a printer, though he had already one son, James, of that profession. In 1717 my brother James returned from England with a press and letters to set up his business in Boston. I liked it much better than that of my father, but still had a hankering for the sea. To prevent the apprehended effect of such an inclination, my father was impatient to have me bound to my brother. I stood out some time, but at last was persuaded, and signed the indentures when I was yet but twelve years old. I was to serve as an apprentice till I was twenty-one years of age, only I was to be allowed journeyman's wages during the last year. In a little time I made great proficiency in the business, and became a useful hand to my brother. I now had access to better books, an acquaintance with the apprentice of booksellers enabled me sometimes to borrow a small one, which I was careful to return soon and clean. Often I sat up in my room reading the greatest part of the night. When the book was borrowed in the evening, and to be returned early in the morning, lest it should be missed or wanted. After some time an ingenious tradesman, Mr. Matthew Adams, who had a pretty collection of books, and who frequented our printing-house, took notice of me, invited me to his library, and very kindly lent me such books as I chose to read. I now took a fancy to poetry, and made some little pieces. My brother, thinking it might turn to account, encouraged me, and put me on composing occasional ballads. One was called The Lighthouse Tragedy, and contained an account of the drowning of Captain Worthilake with his two daughters, the other was a sailor's song on the taking of Teach, or Blackbeard, the pirate. They were wretched stuff in the Grub Street ballad style, and when they were printed he sent me out to the town to sell them. The first sold wonderfully, the event being recent, having made a great noise. This flattered my vanity, but my father discouraged me by ridiculing my performances, and telling me verse-makers were generally beggars. So I escaped being a poet, 
most probably a very bad one, but as prose writing had been of great use to me in the course of my life, and was a principal means of my advancement, I shall now tell you how in such a situation I acquired what little ability I have in that way. There was another bookish lad in the town, John Collins by name, with whom I was intimately acquainted. We sometimes disputed, and very fond we were of argument, and very desirous of confuting one another, with disputatious turn, by the way, is apt to become a very bad habit, making people often extremely disagreeable in company, by the contradiction that is necessary to bring it into practice, and thence, besides souring and spoiling the conversation, is productive of disgusts and, perhaps, enmities, where you may have occasion for friendship. I had caught it by reading my father's books of dispute about religion. Persons of good sense, I have since observed, seldom fall into it, except lawyers, university men, and men of all sorts that have been bred at Edinburgh. A question was once, somehow or other, started between Collins and me, of the propriety of educating the female sex in learning, and their abilities for study. He was of the opinion that it was improper, and that they were naturally unequal to it. I took the contrary side perhaps a little for the dispute's sake. He was naturally more eloquent, and had already plenty of words, and sometimes, as I thought, bore me down more by his fluency than by the strength of his reasons. As we parted without settling the point, and were not to see one another again for some time, I sat down to put my arguments in writing, which I copied fair and sent to him. He answered, and I replied, Three or four letters of a side had passed when my father happened to find my papers and read them. Without entering into the discussion, he took occasion to talk to me about the manner of my writing, observed that, though I had the advantage of my antagonist in correct spelling and pointing, which I owed to the printing-house, I fell far short in elegance of expression, in method, and in persecuity, of which he convinced me by several instances. I saw the justice of his remarks, and hence grew more attentive to the manner in writing, and determined to endeavour at improvement. About this time I met with an odd volume of The Spectator. It was the third I had never before seen any of them. I bought it, read it over and over, and was much delighted with it. I thought the writing excellent, and wished, if possible, to imitate it. With this view I took some of the papers, and making short hints of the sentiment in each sentence, laid them by a few days, and then, without looking at the book, tried to complete the papers again, by expressing each hinted sentiment at length, and as fully as it had been expressed before, in any subtle words which should come to hand. Then I compared my spectator with the original, discovered some of my faults, and corrected them but I found I wanted a stock of words, or a readiness in recollecting and using them, which I thought I should have acquired before that time, if I had gone on making verses, since the continual occasion for words of the same import, but of different length, to suit the measure, or of different sound for the rhyme, would have laid me under a constant necessity of searching for variety, and also have tended to fix that variety in my mind, and make me master of it. Therefore I took some of the tales and turned them into verse, and after a time, when I had pretty well forgotten the prose, turned them back again. I also sometimes jumbled my collections of hints into confusion, and after some weeks endeavoured to reduce them into the best order, before I began to form the full sentences and complete the paper. This was to teach me method in the arrangement of thoughts. By comparing my work afterwards with the original, I discovered many faults and amended them. But I sometimes had the pleasure of fancying that, in certain particulars of small import, I had been lucky enough to improve the method of the language, and this encouraged me to think I might possibly in time come to be a tolerable English writer, of which I was extremely ambitious. My time for these exercises and for reading was at night, after work, or before it began, in the morning, or on Sundays, 
when I contrived to be in the printing-house alone, evading as much as I could the common attendance on pulpit worship, which my father used to extract of me when I was under his care, and which indeed I still thought a duty, though I could not, as it seemed to me, afford time to practice it. A daily London journal comprising satirical essays on social subjects, published by Addison and Steele in 1711 and 1712, The Spectator, and its predecessor, The Tattler, 1709, marked the beginning of periodical literature. When about sixteen years of age, I happened to meet with a book, written by one Tryon, recommending a vegetable diet. I determined to go into it. My brother, being yet unmarried, did not keep house, but boarded himself and his apprentices in another family. My refusing to eat flesh occasioned an inconveniency, and I was frequently chided for my singularity. I made myself acquainted with Tyrone's manner of preparing some of his dishes, such as boiling potatoes or rice, making hasty pudding, and a few others, and then proposed to my brother that if he would give me weekly half the money he paid for my board, I would board myself. He instantly agreed to it, and I presently found that I could save half of what he paid me. This was an additional fund for buying books, but I had another advantage in it, my brother and the rest going from the printing-house to their meals, I remained there alone and, dispatching presently my light repast, which often was no more than a biscuit or a slice of bread, a handful of raisins, or a tart from the pastry-cooks, and a glass of water, had the rest of the time till their return for study, in which I made the greatest progress, for that greater clearness of head and quicker apprehension which usually attended temperance in eating and drinking. And now it was being on some occasion made ashamed of my ignorance in figures, which I had twice failed in learning when at school, I took Crocker's book of arithmetic, and went through the whole by myself with great ease. I also read Seller and Shemmy's book of navigation, and became acquainted with the little geometry they contained, but never proceeded farther in that science. And I read about this time Locke on Human Understanding, and The Art of Thinking, by Monsieur Dupont Royal. John Locke, 1632-1704, to 1704, a celebrated English philosopher, founder of the so-called Common Sense School of Philosophers, he drew up a constitution for the colonists of Carolina. A noted society of scholarly and devout men occupying the Abbey of Port Royal near Paris, who published learned books among the one here referred to better known as the Port Royal Logic. While I was intended on improving my language, I met with an English grammar, I think it was Greenwood's, at the end of which there were two little sketches of the arts of rhetoric and logic, the latter finishing with a specimen of a dispute with the Socratic method, and soon after I procured Xenophon's memorable things of Socrates, wherein there are many instances of the same method. I was charmed with it, adopted it, dropped my abrupt contradiction and positive argumentation, and put on the humble inquirer and doubter, and being then, from reading Shaftesbury and Collins, become a real doubter in many points of our religious doctrine. I found this method safest for myself, and very embarrassing to those against whom I used it. Therefore I took a delight in it, practiced it continually, and grew very artful and expert in drawing people, even of superior knowledge, into concessions, the consequence of which they did not foresee, entangling them in difficulties out of which they could not extricate themselves, and so obtaining victories that neither myself nor my cause always deserved. I continued this method some few years, but gradually left it, retaining only the habit of expressing myself in terms of modest diffidence, never using, when I advanced anything that may possibly be disputed, the words certainly, undoubtedly, or any others that gave an air of positiveness to an opinion, but rather say, I conceive or apprehend a thing to be so and so it appears to me, or I should think it so or so, for such and such reasons, or I imagine it to be so, or it is so, if I am not mistaken. 
This habit, I believe, has been of great advantage to me when I have had occasion to inculcate my opinions and persuade men into measures that I have been from time to time engaged in promoting. And, as the chief ends of conversation are to inform, or to be informed, to please, or to persuade, I wish well-meaning sensible men would not lessen their power of doing good by a positive, assuming manner that seldom fails to disgust, tends to create opposition, and to defeat every one of those purposes for which speech was given to us, to wit, giving or receiving information or pleasure. For if you would inform a positive and dogmatical manner, in advancing your sentiments may provoke contradiction and prevent a candid attention. If you wish information and improvement from the knowledge of others, and yet at the same time express yourself as firmly fixed in your present opinion, modest, sensible men, who do not love disputation, will probably leave you undisturbed in the possession of your error. And by such a manner you can seldom hope to recommend yourself in pleasing. Pope says, judiciously, Men should be taught as if you taught them not and things unknown prospered as things forgot, further recommending to us to speak though sure with seeming diffidence. And he might have coupled with this line that which he has coupled with another, I think, less properly, for want of modesty is want of sense. If you ask why less properly, I must repeat the lines. Immodest words admit of no defense, for want of modesty is want of sense now is not want of sense wherein a man is so unfortunate as to want it some apology for his want of modesty and would not the lines stand more justly thus immodest words admit but this defence the want of modesty is want of sense this however i submit to better judgments socrates confuted his opponents in an argument by asking questions so skilfully devised that the answers would confirm the questioner's position or show the error of the opponent alexander pope sixteen eighty eight to seventeen forty four the greatest english poet of the first half of the eighteenth century my brother had in seventeen twenty or seventeen twenty one begun to print a newspaper it was the second that appeared in america and was called the new england Courant. The only one before it was the Boston News Letter. I remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking as not likely to succeed, one newspaper being in their judgment enough for America. At this time, 1771, there were not less than five and twenty. He went on, however, with the undertaking, and after having worked in composing the types and printing off the sheets, I was employed to carry the papers through the streets to the customers. Franklin's memory does not serve him correctly here. The Corrent was really the fifth newspaper established in America, although generally called the fourth because the first, Public Occurrences, published in Boston in 1690, was suppressed after the first issue. Following is the order in which the other four papers were published. Boston Newsletter, 1704. Boston Gazette, December 21st, 1719. The American Weekly Mercury, Philadelphia, December 22nd, 1719. The New England Courant, 1721. He had some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces for this paper, which gained it credit and made it more in demand. And these gentlemen often visited us, hearing their conversations and their account of the approbation their papers were received with, I was excited to try my hand among them. But being still a boy, and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in his paper, if he knew it to be mine, I contrived to disguise my hand, and, writing an anonymous paper, I put it in at night under the door of the printing-house. It was found in the morning, and communicated to his writing friends, when they called in as usual. They read it, commented on it in my hearing, and I had the exquisite pleasure of finding it met with their approbation, and that their different guesses at the author, none were named but men of some character among us for learning and ingenuity. I suppose now that I was rather lucky in my judges, and that perhaps they were not really so very good ones as I then esteemed them. 
Encouraged, however, by this, I wrote and conveyed in the same way to the press several more papers, which were equally approved, and I kept my secret till my small fund of sense for such performances was pretty well exhausted. And then I discovered it. When I began to be considered a little more by my brother's acquaintances, and in a manner that did not quite please him, as he thought probably with reason, that it tended to make me too vain, and perhaps this might be one occasion of the differences that we began to have about this time. Though a brother, he considered himself as my master, and me as his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same services from me as he would from another, while I thought he deemed me too much in sum he required of me, who, from a brother, expected more indulgence. Our disputes were often brought before our father, and I fancy I was either generally in the right, or else a better pleader, because the judgment was generally in my favour. But my brother was passionate, and had often beaten me, which I took extremely amiss, and, thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. One of the pieces in our newspaper on some political point which I have now forgotten gave offence to the assembly. He was taken up, censured, and imprisoned for a month by the speaker's warrant. I suppose because he would not discover his author, I too was taken up and examined before the council, but though I did not give them any satisfaction, they contented themselves with admonishing me and dismissed me, considering age, perhaps, as an apprentice who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, which I resented a good deal, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I made bold to give our rulers some rubs in it, which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light, as a young genius that had a turn for libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was accompanied with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin could no longer print the paper called the New England Corrent. There was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends what should be done in this case. Some proposed to evade the order by changing the name of the paper, but my brother, seeing inconveniences in that, it was finally concluded on as a better way to let it be printed for the future under the name of Benjamin Franklin, and to avoid the censure of the assembly that might fall on him as still printing it by his apprentice, the contrivance was that my old indenture should be returned to me with a full discharge on the back of it, to be shown on occasion but to secure to him the benefits of my service, I was to sign new indentures for the remainder of the term, which were to be kept private. A very flimsy scheme it was, however. It was immediately executed, and the paper went on accordingly, under my name, for several months. At length, a fresh difference arising between my brother and me, I took upon me to assert my freedom, presuming that he would not venture to produce the new indentures, it was not fair in me to take this advantage, and this I therefore reckoned one of the first errata of my life. But the unfairness of it weighed little with me, when under the impressions of resentment for the blows his passion too often urged him to bestow upon me, though he was otherwise not an ill-natured man, perhaps I was too saucy and provoking. When he found I would leave him, he took care to prevent my getting employment in any other printing-house of the town, by going round and speaking to every master, who accordingly refused to give me work. I then thought of going to New York, as the nearest place where there was a printer, and I was rather inclined to leave Boston, when I reflected that I had already made myself a little obnoxious to the governing party, and from the arbitrary proceedings of the assembly, in my brother's case, it was likely I might, if I stayed, soon bring myself into scrapes, and farther, that my indiscreet disputations about religion began to make me pointed at with horror by good people as an infidel or atheist. I determined on the point, but my father now siding with my brother. I was sensible that, if I attempted to go openly, means would be used to prevent me. My friend Collins, therefore, undertook to manage a little for me. 
he agreed with the captain of a new york sloop for my passage under the notion of my being a young acquaintance of his so i sold some of my books to raise a little money was taken on board privately and as we had a fair wind in three days i found myself in new york near three hundred miles from home a boy of but seventeen without the least recommendation to or knowledge of any person in the place and with very little money in my pocket End of chapter two chapter three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of benjamin franklin edited by frank woodward pine chapter three arrival in philadelphia my inclinations for the sea were by this time worn out or i might now have gratified them but having a trade and supposing myself a pretty good workman i offered my service to the printer in the place old mr william bradford who had been the first printer in pennsylvania but removed from thence upon the quarrel of george keith he could give me no employment having little to do and help enough already but says he my son at philadelphia has lately lost his principal hand aquila rose by death if you go thither i believe he may employ you philadelphia was a hundred miles further i set out however in a boat for amboy leaving my chest and things to follow me round by sea in crossing the bay we met with a squall that tore our rotten sails to pieces preventing our getting into the kill and drove us upon long island in our way a drunken dutchman who was a passenger too fell overboard when he was sinking i reached through the water to his shock pate and drew him up so that we got him in again his ducking sobered him a little and he went to sleep taking first out of his pocket a book which he desired i would dry for him it proved to be my old favourite author bunyan's pilgrim's progress in dutch finely printed on good paper with copper cuts a dress better than i had ever seen it wear in its own language i have since found that it has been translated into most of the languages of europe and suppose it has been more generally read than any other book except perhaps the bible honest john was the first that i know of who mixed narration and dialogue a method of writing very engaging to the reader who in the most interesting parts finds himself as it were brought into the company and present at the discourse defoe in his crusoe his mall flanders religious courtship family instructor and other pieces has imitated it with success and richardson has done the same in his pamela etc kill van kill the channel separating staten island from new jersey on the north samuel richardson the father of the english novel wrote pamela clarissa harlowe and the history of sir charles grandison novels published in the form of letters when we drew near the island we found it was at a place where there could be no landing there being a great surf on the stony beach so we dropped anchor and swung round towards the shore some people came down to the water edge and hallowed to us as we did to them but the wind was so high and the surf so loud that we could not hear so as to understand each other there were canoes on the shore and we made signs and hallowed that they should fetch us but they either did not understand us or thought it impracticable so they went away and night coming on we had no remedy but to wait till the wind should abate and in the meantime the boatman and i concluded to sleep if we could and so crowded into the scuttle with the dutchman who was still wet and the spray beating over the head of our boat leaked through to us so that we were soon almost as wet as he in this manner we lay all night with very little rest but the wind abating the next day we made a shift to reach amboy before night having been thirty hours on the water without victuals or any drink but a bottle of filthy rum the water we'd sailed on being salt in the evening i found myself very feverish and went to bed but having read somewhere that cold water drank plentifully was good for a fever i followed the prescription sweat plentifully most of the night my fever left me and in the morning crossing the ferry i proceeded on my journey on foot 
having fifty miles to Burlington, where I was told I could find boats that would carry me the rest of the way to Philadelphia. It rained very hard that day. I was thoroughly soaked, and by noon a good deal tired, so I stopped at a poor inn, where I stayed all night, beginning now to wish that I had never left home. I cut so miserable a figure, too, that I found by some questions asked me I was suspected to be some runaway servant, and in danger of being taken up on that suspicion. However, I proceeded the next day, and got in the evening to an inn within eight or ten miles of Burlington, kept by one Dr. Brown. He entered into conversation with me while I took some refreshment, and, finding I had read a little, became very sociable and friendly. Our acquaintance continued as long as he lived. He had been, I imagine, an itinerant doctor, for there was no town in England, or, or country in Europe, of which he could not give a very particular account. He had some letters, and was ingenious, but much of an unbeliever, and wickedly undertook, some years after, to travesty the Bible in a doggerel verse, as Cotton had done Virgil. By this means he set many of the facts in a very ridiculous light, and might have hurt weak minds if his work had been published, but it never was. At his house I lay that night, and the next morning reached Burlington, but had the mortification to find the regular boats were gone a little before my coming, and no other expected to go before Tuesday, this being Saturday, wherefore I returned to an old woman in the town, of whom I had brought gingerbread to eat on the water, and asked her advice. She invited me to lodge at her house until a passage by water could offer, and being tired with my foot travelling, I accepted the invitation. She, understanding I was a printer, would have had me stay at that town and follow my business, being ignorant of the stock necessary to begin with. She was very hospitable, gave me a dinner of ox cheek and great good will, accepting only a pot of ale in return, and I thought myself fixed till Tuesday should come. However, walking in the evening by the side of the river, a boat came by which I found was going towards Philadelphia, with several people in her. They took me in, and as there was no wind, we rode all the way, and about midnight, not having yet seen the city, some of the company were confident we must have passed it, and would row no further. The others knew not where we were, so we were put toward the shore, got into a creek, landed near an old fence with the rails of which we made a fire, that night being cold, in October, and there we remained till daylight. Then one of the company knew the place to be Cooper's Creek, a little above Philadelphia, which we saw as soon as we got out of the creek, and arrived there about eight or nine o'clock on the Sunday morning, and landed at the Market Street Wharf. I have been the most particular in this description of my journey, and shall be so if my first entry into that city, that you may in your mind compare such unlikely beginnings with the future I have since made there. I was in my working dress, my best clothes being to come round by sea. I was dirty from my journey, my pockets were stuffed out with shirts and stockings, and I knew no soul nor where to look for lodging. I was fatigued with travelling, rowing, and want of rest. I was very hungry, and my whole stock of cash consisted of a Dutch dollar and about a shilling in copper. The latter I gave the people of the boat for my passage, who at first refused it on account of my rowing, but I insisted on their taking it, a man being sometimes more generous when he has but a little money than when he has plenty, perhaps though fear of being thought of to have but little. Then I walked up the street, gazing about till near the market-house I met a boy with bread. I had made many a meal on bread, and inquiring where he got it, I went immediately to the baker's he directed me to, in Second Street, and asked for biscuit, intending such as we had in Boston. But they, it seems, were not made in Philadelphia. Then I asked for a three-penny loaf, and was told they had none such. So not considering or knowing the difference of money, and the greater cheapness, nor the names of his bread, I bade him give me three penny worth of any sort. He gave me accordingly three great puffy rolls. I was surprised at the quantity, but took it, and having no room in my pockets, walked off with a roll under each arm, and eating the other. Thus I made up Market Street as far as Fourth Street, passing by the door of Mr. Reed, my future wife's father when she, standing at the door, saw me, and thought I made, as I certainly did, a most awkward, ridiculous appearance. 
Then I turned and went down Chestnut Street, and part of Walnut Street, eating my roll all the way, and coming round I found myself again at Market Street Wharf, near the boat I came in, to which I went for a draught of river water, and being filled with one of my rolls, gave the other two to a woman and her child, that came down the river in the boat with us, and were waiting to go farther. Thus refreshed, I walked again up the street, which by this time had many clean-dressed people in it, and who were all walking the same way. I joined them, and thereby was led to the great meeting-house of the Quakers near the market. I sat down among them, and, after looking round a while and hearing nothing said, being very drowsy through labour and want of rest the preceding night, I fell fast asleep, and continued so till the meeting broke up, when one was kind enough to rouse me. This was therefore the first house I was in, or slept in, in Philadelphia. Walking down again toward the street, and looking in the faces of people, I met a young Quaker man, whose countenance I liked, and accosted him, requesting he would tell me where a stranger could get lodging. We were then near the sign of the Three Mariners. Here, says he, is one place that entertains strangers, but it is not a reputable house. If thee wilt walk with me, I'll show thee a better. He brought me to the crooked billet in Water Street, where I got a dinner, and while I was eating it several sly questions were asked me, as it seemed to be suspected from my youth and appearance that I might be some runaway. After dinner my sleepiness returned, and being shown to a bed I lay down without undressing, and slept till six in the evening, was called to supper, went to bed again very early, and slept sound till next morning. Then I made myself as tidy as I could, and went to Andrew Bradford the printer's. I found in the shop the old man, his father, whom I had seen in New York, and who, travelling on horseback, had got to Philadelphia before me. He introduced me to his son, who received me civilly, gave me a breakfast, but told me he did not at present want a hand, being lately supplied with one. But there was another printer in town, lately set up, one Keimer, who, perhaps, might employ me, if not, I should be welcome to lodge at his house, and he would give me a little work to do now and then, till fuller business should offer. The old gentleman said he would go with me to the new printer, and when we found him, neighbor, says Bradford, I have brought to see you a young man of your business. Perhaps you may want such a one. He asked me a few questions, put a composing stick in my hand to see how I worked, and then said he would employ me soon, though he had just then nothing for me to do, and, taking old Bradford, whom he had never seen before, to be one of the town's people that had a good will for him, entered into a conversation on his present undertaking and prospects, while Bradford, not discovering that he was the other printer's father, on Keimer's saying he expected soon to get the greatest part of the business into his own hands, drew him on by artful questions and starting little doubts, to explain all his views, what interest he relied on, and in what manner he intended to proceed. I, who stood by and heard all, saw immediately that one of them was a crafty old sophister, and the other a mere novice. Bradford left me with Keimer, who was greatly surprised when I told him who the old man was. Keimer's printing-house, I found, consisted of an old shattered press, and one small worn-out font of English, which he was using himself, composing an elegy on Aquila Rose, before mentioned, an ingenious young man of excellent character, much respected in the town, clerk of the assembly, and a pretty poet. Keimer made verses, too, but very indifferently. He could not be said to write them, for his manner was to compose them in the types directly out of his head. So there being no copy, but one pair of cases, and the elegy likely to require all the letter, no one could help him. I endeavoured to put his press, which he had not yet used, and of which he understood nothing, into order fit to be worked with, and promised to come and print off his elegy as soon as he should have got it ready. I returned to Bradford's, who gave me a little job to do for the present, and there I lodged and dieted. A few days after, Keimer sent for me to print off the elegy, and now he had got another pair of cases, and a pamphlet to reprint, on which he set me to work. These two printers I found poorly qualified for their business. Bradford had not been bred to it, and was very illiterate and Keimer, though something of a scholar, was a mere compositor, knowing nothing of press-work. He had been one of the French 
profits and could act their enthusiastic agitations at the time he did not profess any particular religion but something of all on occasion was very ignorant of the world and had as i afterward found a good deal of the knave in his composition he did not like my lodging at bradford's while i worked with him he had a house indeed but without furniture so he could not lodge me but he got me a lodging at mr reed's before mentioned who was the owner of this house and my chest and clothes being come by this time i made rather a more respectable appearance in the eyes of miss reed than i had done when she first happened to see me eating my roll in the street protestants of the south of france who became fanatical under the persecutions of louis the fourteenth and though they had the gift of prophecy as they had mottoes no taxes and liberty of conscience i began to have some acquaintance among the young people of the town that were lovers of reading with whom i spent my evenings very pleasantly and gained money by my industry and frugality i lived very agreeably forgetting boston as much as i could and not desiring that any there should know where i resided except my friend collins who was in my street and kept it when i wrote to him at length an incident happened that sent me back again much sooner than i had intended i had a brother-in-law robert holmes master of a sloop that traded between boston and delaware he being at newcastle forty miles below philadelphia heard thereof me and wrote me a letter mentioning the concerns of my friends in boston at my abrupt departure assuring me of their good will to me and that everything would be accommodated to my mind if i would return to which he exhorted me very earnestly i wrote an answer to this letter thanked him for his advice but stated that my reasons for quitting boston fully and in such a light as to convince him i was not so wrong as he had apprehended End of chapter three